Hello and good afternoon, everyone. My name is Hugh Ong and I'm an Innovation Manager here at the Food Agility CRC. It is my absolute pleasure to introduce our next keynote speaker, Dr. Molly Jan, who will be speaking on the topic of cybersecurity in food supply chains. Dr. Jan is a professor of agronomy at the University of Wisconsin-Madison and the founding principal of the Jan Research Group, an organization that focuses on domestic and global food system stability and security. She also consults globally in agriculture, food security, risk in food systems, life sciences, national security, and environment. Dr. Jan is currently a program manager within DARPA, working on national security projects for the United States. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Molly Jan. Thank you, everybody. Uh, it's delightful to be with you. Uh, despite the hour, it's 10.30 p.m. here, so forgive me, you're lucky I'm not in my jammies. Um, and it is uh, certainly my honor and, and uh, pleasure to have prepared a talk that is about some very serious topics. Um, and just to clarify uh, my affiliation, I'm presently on loan to the US government from my position in the Department of Agronomy uh, at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. But this work has been done as part of my independent research group. And uh, that group is primarily funded by NASA, but it also operates under a cooperative research and development agreement with the US Department of Agriculture. So what I'm gonna try to do in this talk is set the frame for how we got this way, and I'll explain what I mean by this way. And uh, I won't have much time to talk about solution. I'll hope that the uh, panel may be a chance to pick up some of the themes, but I am gonna uh, lay a, a kind of theme for where we are right now. And I think the preceding discussion on collaboration um, will be especially important as we think about solutions for the particular problem I've been challenged with, but I think in general, it's a really important way forward. Um, this says March 15th, because it's still March 15th here, but I know it's March 16th there. So with that, um, I'd like to introduce my double great grandfather. For any of you who are Canadian or with Canadian roots or who are wheat breeders, you'll know the variety Mark with Sweet, uh, which his son Charles bred. Uh, this is William Saunders, who also founded uh, Ag Canada and uh, the, the uh, advent of professionalized research in Canada. And I'd like to use this slide to make the point that uh, to put our, our current food systems into perspective. Um, for most of human history, that is for uh, millions of years, uh, hum humanity's food systems were had the following characteristics at the top of the slides, deeply decentralized, redundant, energetically diffuse, nutritionally diverse, and were focused on sufficiency, not overall abundance or productivity. Uh, 10,000 years ago, we went through a, a, a revolution that, whose importance can hardly be overstated. And that was to leverage the insight that for our species, Plants were our solar collectors. They were the way we intercepted sunlight and turned it into chemical energy for human consumption. And we organized those solar collectors into ordered arrays, fields, agra, uh, meaning that, that word derived, or meaning fields in Greek. And that particular innovation uh, 10,000 years ago has established us as a phenomenally and in successful invasive species. Um, one with a magnitude of impact on the planet that arguably has never been seen by uh, a species at least as big as us. Um, plants created our atmosphere, so we're not necessarily the highest impact species, but we're certainly having a great impact on the condition of the planet. With the rise of, so that always all rolled along for 9,000, you know, 800 of those years. But with the rise of professionalized research, with the founding of the first agricultural research establishment in the UK, followed by uh, advances across Europe and the US, um, and eventually globally, we saw a commercial agriculture fueled by technology incredibly intensive energy investments 
uh, in both uh, energy per se and water extraction. We have created systems that are indeed extraordinarily productive and highly efficient. However, uh, they are uh, largely composed of gen genetically uniform, very productive, very expansive monocultures. We rely on relatively few species out of the 20,000 or so, 30,000, I've seen many different estimates for how many edible plant species there are. We've never systematically prospected really across that. Again, as I pointed out, extremely energy and water intensive, and that energy withdrawal is linked to the, uh, because of thermodynamics, if we pull energy from our trickle charge battery earth, out into the atmosphere, we are accelerating our arrival with equilibrium at space, which by the way, doesn't look good. And um, in the meantime, we push energy out into ourselves, lots more of us, fatter of us, our environment with activated nitrogen, uh, carbon in the form of methane, um, as well as phosphate, many toxic externalities occur as a result of our current uh, agricultural practices. Because we grow our food outside, we're vulnerable to the to extreme weather. And I'm going to talk a lot more about cascading events shortly. Um, we're also seeing uh, in some parts of the world declining diet related health. And uh, as of about five or so years ago, be, we we're beginning to see declines in global food security overall. Uh, COVID has accelerated that with a big jab up in uh, poverty. And I think uh, it remains to be seen how that will play out. But what we've proven to ourselves is that driving exclusively at abundance uh, gives us abundance and it gives us a number of other uh, very foreseeable outcomes, um, but it has created a massively complicated and com complex, uh, largely opaque critical infrastructure. And one way to show that is this diagram. Uh, with this diagram, I'd like to um, introduce the term food systems. And when I use that term, I'm using it inclusive, not only of agricultural production, but distribution, processing, manufacturing, uh, retail, and consumption. And that consumption piece is gonna be important later in the talk as well. Um, again, as a result of this massive energy and fossil water binge. Um, and so we created these systems, uh, optimized, heavily, intensely optimized, but optimized for uh, efficiency, peacetime, globalized trade regimes, and a relatively stable environment. So about 10 years ago, I was serving in a government role, in my first government role, this is my second. Um, and I began to ask myself, um, to what extent are US, and forgive me, this is a fairly US centric um, talk, but uh, US and global food systems, uncontrollable, fragile, and even hijackable. This is the diagram that uh, I was given by the agency I currently work for that just is one depiction of the food system with all of its inputs and outputs and energy conversions and more energy conversions and, and transports. And in short, we have created um, a system that is very good at what it was designed to do, but uh, in my opinion, and we can talk about this, cannot be decorated sufficiently to bring this system back into any condition that I could defend as planetary safe operating space. And that's an important statement I just made. Um, food systems, as opposed to just focusing on agriculture or agrotechnology, food systems, that term impels us to deal with consumption and the dynamics of consumption as part of the food system. Lots has been uh, said about the importance of rising global affluence, although, as I said, COVID is giving a smack to those numbers. Um, we have seen over some decades a steady rise in global affluence and therefore uh, not only more people, but more intense demand and demand for 
uh, better quality food from larger and larger numbers of people. Um, and, and some very pronounced demographic turns, notably urbanization, that is concentrating those populations in megacities, the likes of which probably we couldn't have imagined even just a few decades ago. Um, we have seen that that drive to efficiency uh, and uh, and low relative low margins has created also a drive to consolidation um, in the world food system and certainly in the U.S. food system. I use this slide to make the point that um, the global food system, on top of being about production and consumption, is comprised of intersecting, interacting, and mutually interdependent, complex, highly consolidated in some instances, food, financial, and energy networks. And these networks uh, are, cannot in any meaningful way be, be really separated. And certainly risk within one of those networks is by no means limited to that network. Um, so this just is an illustration of how, uh, and Australia knows this full of well, that uh, the global grain trade is dominated by uh, four different companies, roughly. This is a little bit out of date, um, but that, you know, certainly a majority of grains traded are traded by these companies that themselves are, are very consequential forces within the global, um, within global markets. This is, an, this is an illustration that became interesting to me uh, in my position uh, as Undersecretary of Agriculture. I went looking for a treatment of risk in the US food system that I could credit from that position. And I really couldn't find one. In fact, um, I'm in Washington right now, so I'm without my library, but this is the time I would hold up a book called A Taste of The Taste of War by Lizzie Collingham. I recommend this book. I've handed out probably a hundred copies of this book, which is not a small thing because it's fairly thick. Um, it's a history of food in World War II. And um, in the United States, when uh, as the UK was facing some very dire situations with regard to food supply, the Minister of Food came to find his counterpart in the United States. He was surprised to discover there was no Minister of Food in the United States. There was a Minister of Agri, or essentially Secretary of Agriculture. And so it was a challenge in the, under the face, in the face of World War II, for the United States to mobilize a response and many, many mistakes were made in the process of doing the incredible um, commitment to collaboration that the allies in World War II represented. But this, this uh, is a picture that shows the ways in which these, these various um, stresses that are one way or the other really fueled by this uh, binge on energy uh, can interact. And on this, you'll see um, failure of climate change mitigation and adaptation, failure of global governance, something we're seeing uh, a lot of uh, large scale and voluntary migration. This last decade has certainly seen a, actually more people on the move since World War II. Rising famine, uh, ac economic problems, all these things can come together around uh, several features in the middle that are a really significant concern. Large scale migration, profound social instability and failure of national governance. Um, so the stability of our food systems really are the stability of our, our, uh, our civilizations and nations. So 10 years ago when I was in that job, I was, I was interested in this challenge of preparing my country to have these discussions about food systems from the US Department of Agriculture made sense to me that that would be a place with, that would lead it in our government. Um, so I began to search for how we would use contemporary methods to share information. We were not particularly, okay, we were bad at that. I was gonna say we're not particularly good, um, but it's late and I wanna be efficient. So we were, we were bad at that. And uh, so were other parts of our government. And uh, after 9-11, some parts of our government 
uh, were forced to get better at sharing information. And this particular individual was a senior official in our intelligence community. My efforts to build out a real time depiction and a dynamic depiction of risk in US agricultural and global food system had come to his attention. And while he looks mad in this picture and he sort of was at the time, he was actually appreciative of the work uh, we were trying to do from USDA and uh, understood also the challenges we would face as in setting up groups that would engage in as trusted partners in information sharing. And then he asked me this very difficult question. Um, and he said, uh, please tell me one thing, why are we subsidizing? Please tell me, Madam Undersecretary, why are we subsidizing the mining of non-renewable fossil water resources in the United States? And furthermore, in locations where when that water is exhausted, the people who live there will have to leave those places. So it's not just depleting the resource, it's economic uh, holocaust for that part of the US if the water runs out. And why are we not only doing that, why are we subsidizing its export to, and his, his question at the time was China, um, why are we doing this? And what are the implications of this choice for the long-term stability of US and global agriculture? Well, I could not answer his question. And I don't like not being able to answer his question. So as any of you who've held jobs like that know, you always compliment the person on what a great question they've just asked. And then he could tell what I was doing. So he skewered me a bit more and said, are you telling me that we don't have clear, consistent, trusted ways to share dynamic information about really risk in our food systems and the potential implications for US national and global security? No, actually, we don't track our food systems that way. We have lots of yield estimates. We track critical infrastructures and many other uh, system attributes, but we don't think about food systems per se that way. And that began a journey about which I will tell you uh, for the rest of the talk. Um, I pivoted and realized that while my mission, I had many, but some of my missions were really focused on bringing agricultural practices at the scale we uh, use them in the United States. It's really by far the dominant way we care for our country and our, and our continent. Um, likewise, uh, well, for many other parts of the world. Um, I, as much as I was interested in mitigating the damage we were doing as, as, a, as a way, in other words, doing better sustainability and all of that, I had begun to uh, want to do something that I'm actually trying to do here at DARPA. And that is add up the use of the planet's resources and the choices we're making in technology and, uh, and, there are implications for planetary and health consequences. And so I did a pivot. I did a pivot uh, to focus on the word risk. And so in 2014, um, by this time, I had begun to collaborate with insurance, the insurance sector, because I knew that insurance knew more about the word risk than I did. And I knew that... Um, that I would like to socialize my concerns about agriculture and the food system with, uh, with insurance. And this little publication, which came out in 2014, was a first step in doing that, which was um, it, for any of you who work in our space, and I think that's all of you, it's certainly not news to you that food insecurity poses a significant risk to what they call global society. It might be a relatively new thought or a new thought that insurance can play a large role in risk mitigation and management, as well as in innovation and investment. But uh, when I had gone to learn about risk, I initially went to the actuaries and found a cell of actuaries in the UK that have been tremendous collaborators uh, throughout, throughout this journey. And they pointed out that insurers not only uh, 
are familiar to us as customers, but of course they take our premiums and they are very consequential investors. And so uh, speaking to insurance was not only about getting the insurance side correct, it's about getting the investment side correct. And um, as a result, I was able to set up some active collaborations which go on today with the actuarial profession uh, in both UK and in North America. So this word risk really came to front and center. I became really interested in interacting chronic and acute stresses, um, which can result in highly significant, but formally, this is important, unmodeled peril. The reason I stress this is cyber is falls into this category of interacting chronic and acute stresses that can result in highly significant but unmodeled peril. Why is it important to stress unmodeled? Because insurance, for example, and governments uh, can address risk that they can simulate or uh, describe. But when we're talking about unmodeled peril, um, our mechanisms of, of, in, of perceiving that risk, interpreting it as a society and working to uh, transfer that risk uh, fail, to, fail to kick in. And so this is especially worrisome to those who are focused on reducing tail risk for enterprises, such as what's called the, the um, enterprise risk managers for uh, corporations or uh, departments of and ministries of defense. When things go wrong, these are, these are the ones holding the bag. So how does cyber risk, why have I taken so long to um, lay this frame? Cyber risk fits exactly into these uh, large, these sort of sprawling, uh, complex uh, dynamics that can um, add up to be, um, be very consequential and relatively likely. So let me tell you a little bit about how um, in a paper that we're in the process of preparing from moving from a white paper to a journal submission, how um, some of the elements or some of the, some of the places is cyber risk starts to enter ag and food systems. Obviously, um, across the developed world, we've had the rise of smart agriculture and internet of things. So um, any manner of farm equipment from robotic milkers to um, planters, harvesters, uh, devices that combine feed rations, that feed data back and forth to equipment manufacturers and farmers um, or to financial houses, much of that infrastructure, at least originally, was released out in the landscape literally wide open. Um, if you think that's scary, I, I won't tell you more than this, which is same was true for medical devices, so we don't get to feel too special in agriculture. So if you have a pacemaker, it's probably pretty easy to hack. Um, and we are starting to see uh, hacks that are really very sophisticated. Uh, one making the rounds uh, in the US Department of Defense community is the use of a um, Internet of Things fish aquarium thermometer that was used to hack into a financial house. So um, this is not sci-fi in the future, it's today. Um, likewise, in uh, transport, uh, and food manufacturing, food processing, distribution and retail. Um, we have seen the rise of, and it's uneven in the United States, these are low margin industries. And so it's not, um, we have not, it, let's just say it's uneven. Um, and it may be that those muddy sheets of paper that some people still use uh, are the analog features that can stop some of the cascading effects about which we're worried. Um, but this risk, these unsecured um, dynamics intersect with other kinds of cyber risk to grid, to transportation, to shipping infrastructure, GPS, et cetera. And so when you add it up, the potential for cascading events is, is very evident. Um, and I make a couple other points. Um, extensive IT systems in ag, 
et cetera, are often out of date, at least in the US, maybe not in Australia. They're definitely not designed to protect against cyber attack. Crews and other employees are not trained to detect or mitigate cyber risk, lack on ship IT support, et cetera. And compliance levels, even for things like food safety systems, at least in the US, are relatively low and certainly uh, very low for cyber. And generally, cyber threat insurance is not available. So my research group, which has made a um, habit in the last number of years of sort of lifting the rock and looking underneath it um, when it's an uncomfortable rock and nobody else wants to do it, we put out a white paper in January of 2019 that listed this out. One of the lessons that um, we cite in that paper, and I'll just take this take you through this very, very quickly because this is a matter of record. Um, but the 2017 hack of the, of the shipping company Maersk was a big wake up call in the United States broadly, not just to um, actually maybe beyond, out, mainly outside of ag, not, uh, but certainly for ag as well. Um, and many of you are probably familiar with that. Um, but just to give you some, uh, some taste of how important this was to the United States. Um, these are our export numbers. 75% of the US ag and food exports go out by sea. Our top trading partners are Mexico and Canada, but really the rest of the, the very important role that America plays in feeding the rest of the world occurs by sea. In June of 2017, escaped, uh, escaped weapons really uh, from Russian attacks on the Ukraine um, irreversibly encrypted Maersk computers master boot record. So this is a fatal, uh, fatal problem. Maersk carries 15 to 20% of all global shipping, 76 ports, 800 vessels. Eh, notable that eight, that our Department of Defense has done more than eight and a half trillion US dollars worth of business. Um, with Maersk uh, in, in the past just about 10 years since the slide was put together. It halted all shipping for 10 days. Ships couldn't be located. Even when they could be located, they couldn't be loaded or unloaded. The only, and you probably know this story, the only thing that saved Maersk was one single computer in Africa that happened to be turned off and unplugged. And this, this incident also showed the importance of human resilience, um, which significantly mitigated the damages, but um, still it was an extremely costly event. And similarly, this escaped weapon hit a number of other companies in completely unrelated sectors as just collateral damage as a result of an active war against Ukraine by Russian military hackers. And for any of you who are interested, I think you'll have my um, deck later. This just gives you some uh, documentation. So we put together some uh, cyber risk scenarios. I have learned from my work with insurance, the power of scenarios. And actually I have to put a special shout out here for the, Afri the Australian National Outlook scenarios that were published about five years ago, um, not quite. Um, those scenarios inspired me to continue the work that Lloyd's, my work with Lloyd's had taught me how to, how to do. When, what, when we put out scenarios, it gives industry and others who care about risk government, who care about risk in food systems, concrete uh, situations to manage to. So we've laid out a few possibilities for um, significant cyber, cyber risk in agriculture, some of which uh, things like Maersk have already happened, some of which have not happened. But and it, and by the and I just want to emphasize, Maersk was collateral damage um, as a result of an active war between Russia and Ukraine. The intent of Russia was not to uh, inflict economic damage to these companies. So one scenario very significant potentially for Australia, given the role of livestock in your economy. Um, so wearable smart technologies for animals and humans has increased significantly um, and uh, disruptions either to the devices or to the data from the devices 
or devices that are important in animal health, such as those that mix rations or deliver rations, anything like that could cause a really consequential interruption in not only animal health and well being and agriculture, but um, national economies, global economies, and uh, potentially uh, have impacts both economic and health. Um, could and we live in terror of um, FMD coming to the United States, so it's possible that such an outbreak or such an episode could obscure the arrival of a disease like that on our shores. Um, so that was one scenario we put out. Um, another scenario was disinformation campaigns targeting perceptions of food safety. About two and a half years ago. I had learned the concept of red teaming, which is now it's a classic tool in uh, defense where you, you, dream, you get your most diabolical minds, and I guess I might qualify by now, and you put them all on a team that's the bad guys, and it's like, it's like white hat hackers, and you send us out to break stuff and see where they break. Um, and so about two and a half years ago, I sat up in bed one Saturday morning and said to my husband, Oh no, I just figured out, you don't actually even have to do anything to the food system. This is before fake news became quite such a thing. Maybe it was three and a half years ago. I could just, like if you put me and the lady in the office next door to me in a room together for about three hours, I bet we could dream up a rumor that would be very tough for our government to dispel and that could go, uh, could be transmitted with intent to do any number of bad things. Um, that was a, that was before uh, disinformation campaigns became uh, de rigueur, but still carefully crafted rumors um, can, can go viral, behave, uh, affect the behavior of civilians, also affect uh, the, the stability of uh, military uh, that are dependent on civilian systems such as the food system. So this was another one. So um, what are some of the things that have actually um, happened and what are some of the papers that, what is the state of the literature right now? Um, this was a nice paper that came out in 2019. I was really glad to see it. It's the first paper that came to our attention um, and I recommend it. Um, so this was um, a paper calling for new perspectives on protecting the U U.S. food and agricultural system. Again, forgive me, this is U.S. centric, um, but I commend it to you and our paper will um, heavily uh, leverage this paper um, and take, uh, take it out of a few, a little bit further. Um, so other areas of cyber risk in food and ag that are on our mind, shipping and transport infrastructure I've already talked about, autonomous vehicles. Um, I'm at DARPA where uh, autonomous vehicles, I think were largely born. Um, and clearly this technology is being used all over for many different things. Um, and again, uh, with little at least initial thought in general to the possibility that the use of these very attractive tools in some instances can also create vulnerabilities. Um, we can see denial of service attacks potentially. So just taking the Wi-Fi down um, altogether and uh, various types of phishing attacks. Uh, and this one uh, cites uh, work in Australia. So um, this is a graph that just shows um, for you, for Australia, um, the annual cyber threat report, July 19 to June 2020, so pretty current. Um, and, it, and for Australia, the conclusion, so this represents all the different cybersecurity incidents not specific to ag and food. Um, so malicious emails are currently and will continue to be the most common type of incident reported in Australia. It is important to ensure security is applied throughout a network and across personal devices. Well, that's a really tall order. Um, these are just some examples of um, cyber attacks that have hit uh, close to home. Um, one, we're seeing um, constant, att constant attacks uh, against uh, infrastructure all around the world, um, you know, <laughs> um, I asked one person in the government who receives 
uh, reports from the developing world on drought on soil moisture and uh, and what else does he read? Soil moisture, mainly soil moisture and market prices. And I said, have you ever thought about scrubbing your numbers for fraud or detection of, of interference? And he sort of chuckled and he said, boy, it's funny. We were just talking about that, but who'd ever want to mess with us? Well, it turns out that it, the part of the world he's worried about is a very rough part of the world where there's tremendous corruption. And so it actually, in fact, there's a lot of fraud in the numbers coming back to him. And it has nothing to do with trying to mess up our drought monitor. It has everything to do with disguising financial corruption. And so whether these are ransomware attacks or malicious attacks or part of coordinated warfare, uh, they can add up in, and compound in very concerning ways. And Australia is not immune. Australia ag sector, of course, is not immune. Um, and so I think you're probably more aware than I am about the, um, the cyber attack that forced, of all things, cancellation of wool sales across all of Australia. So a large proportion of the incidents um, in Australia um, uh, they, it, it, speaking of cooperation, um, it's thought that the reporting in Australia is especially good. Um, and so it's thought that because the level of trust is relatively high, you may think you're always fighting with each other, but let me tell you, <laughs> um, we might have a leg up. I don't know, um, but, and maybe we're getting better, but um, from the rest of the world, the degree of collaboration between the Australian government um, charged with maintaining the inventory of these events and those experiencing them is, is really relatively good in Australia. Um, and of course, you know, top of our mind is, um, is the potential or the, the phenomenon, I should say, of cascading risk, whether it's cascading from ag and or food, and I don't use those two terms synonymously, from our sectors out or from other sectors in, um, we see potential for um, what, what are known as Dragon King events, 